that you're being recorded. Um, so as you can see, we have folks on this panel that are um, top of their game and they're re representing all parts of the United States and all different ways that they've entered into the mural business. Um, so I wanted to just kind of level set and say, why, why is GCAC doing this panel? And um, some of you may know that we did, um, we're about to begin work on a um, community study on um, public art um, for the city. And so uh, that's still, the results of that are still some time away. Um, but we wanted to start having the conversations now. Since uh, the murder of George Floyd and the protests, um, you did see more murals coming up in Columbus, and that's really excited. That exciting. That's gotten a lot of people more interested in how do we bring the social justice message to neighborhoods? How do we bring more beauty and art to the neighborhoods? So we did launch this year uh, a mural assistance grant, um, and that hasn't been announced yet, but you should see something this week. Uh, 23 murals were awarded um, money, and so you'll get to see those within the next 12 months will come up. So we're kind of taking the first step. This is a really important conversation to have, to have these three experts, who can shed light on um, the cultural aspects of the mural community, but also kind of the things they've learned along the way. So I wanted to just kind of say, here's why we're talking about it. Um, there's different ways to enter into the mural world. Um, and I would invite, um, let's start with Woke 3, because he kind of touched on it a little bit on how he got engaged um, we talk a lot about at GCAC, um, you know, we, we do calls, you might get commissioned, you might be tapped by someone, there might be a festival, but Woke 3 kind of uh, took it upon himself to make some stuff happen. So well, why don't you start, Woke, and give us a little bit of that story, expand upon that story a little more. Um, so, like I said, I started off doing graffiti, um, and at some time in college, I was introduced to this book um xxl murals and it was just showing muralists all over the world creating murals and i, I didn't really think about that uh, as far as because by the time i was it was this was a senior year so i didn't think think too much about about that about just being a muralist that i could just do that i was always thinking of, i was always you know thinking about graphic design or something but i, I ended up reading that book and i just kind of thought like man we don't really have like Ever since high school, I've always imagined these big walls that we have, having these murals and um, talking about social issues and having these different messages and things within them. Um, so I ended up, uh, that summer, ended up uh, doing an internship, which led me to a grant um, a thri called the Thrive Grant, Metro Arts Thrive Grant here in Nashville. Um, and I used that grant to uh, pay artists, which all these artists I knew, some of them I kind of, uh, I was just meeting, but paid these artists to come and um, paint these murals. I told them what the the um, theme was about. I told them uh, what we we're trying to do and brought them into um, the community and we kind of created these murals together and things. Um, but during that experience, I started to realize that you, you can get funding for these, for doing mural projects or public art projects. It wasn't really anything that I was really learning about or really knew knew much about. But once I realized that you could get money for doing this, um, I, I just start, I pulled together an arts collective of folks. Um, we got together. We said, "Hey, like it's four of us. Um, let's let's let, let's work together to do these you know, murals that that have that talk about the the civil rights movement in my community, history that um, helps celebrate the community." Um, because North Nashville just has, you know, certain reps and things, but we also have like this history and it's like, let's put it, let's focus that out there. Let's work with organizations. And so that's what we did. We just came together. Uh, we did a, 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 after the North Wall Fest, we did another festival, which we did a mural live in front of folks and they came out and they were able to kind of talk to vendors, listen to live music. And we just, we always kind of kept, every time we've done a mural in our neighborhood, we always... Try, we always celebrated it. We always brought folks together to celebrate those those murals. And just doing that and work and then of course media 
start to come out and want to know more about what you're doing and stuff. That kind of helped bring more work in to where people were starting to, instead of like at the beginning going out and wall scouting and talking to artists, I mean, not talking, talking to property owners and talking to um, just people who ho ho had a uh, wall space, um, it would start to become more of, you know, people are contacting us to come and create murals on their business because they see that the impact, they see the energy that's behind what we're creating. So that's kind of what, mm -hmm. that there was the beginnings of me getting into like my career as a muralist. Thank you. Um, who would like to jump in on that? Daisy or Brooks? Brooks has the festival side. And Daisy, I know you, in our earlier conversations, you talked a lot about the relationship building element. I'll jump. You got it, Daisy? <laughs> I was trying to find, I think, is someone sharing their screen right now? Is anyone else seeing that? Yeah, I was hitting the other mute button too. Okay, yeah. yeah so. <laughs> Go ahead, Brooks. Um, well, three, that was a great synopsis uh, of, of a way to get into murals. I'd be curious how many people here have been painting murals for a while, how many people want to start painting murals. Um, <clears throat> but the best way to start, no matter where you are at your career right now, is to start those relationships and that could be primarily with walls that you want to paint. Uh, once you start walking around the city you'll or your neighborhood, uh, you'll see walls that need some love. Uh, that revitalization is always a good way to start. Um, that's where you'll be able to find people who want to get those walls painted and then be able to find money for it easier. Uh, we've done the same thing here in Reno. We had a section of town called Midtown that was primarily 20 years ago um, crack alleys and prostitution is more or less legal here county to county uh, so that but the illegal prostitution was also rampant in, in that neighborhood and we had one artist eric burke who goes by over under and he started off when he was in his early 20s identifying those walls and now you know 20 25 years later he's painted over 200 murals in reno uh, so if you want to start by identifying those areas that you want to paint uh, and then get a hold of the business owners and then the building owners, those will be the two people you'll need to get uh, some sort of permissions from. Uh, and that way you're gonna, once that, that money train starts rolling into Columbus, um, you'll be able to have places that are ready to paint and a group of people who are actively wanting you to paint. Go ahead, Daisy, then I can come back if you want. Yeah, so um, the way that I came into mural painting was um, through a community project um, that was supported by a community business improvement um, development organization. And um, but I originally my background is community arts and I worked in nonprofit arts for many years. So I had some experience doing um, some public work. Um, but that first project really was an alley that was kind of, you know, a, a blighted alley that um, was taken over and turned into a pedestrian alley um, that was filled with um, murals and art from different communities. And it was, you know, like a one shot kind of thing. They did a kickoff. And then the following year, um, I... I applied to an open call because the year before I had seen the work and the artists working in that space. I was really inspired by it. I've always been an artist. Um, and I thought, you know, I want to paint large scale like that. That looks like fun. I want to, you know, um, make a change in communities by, by sharing my work and that. So I approached it that way. Um, I got that first call. Um, I was very fortunate. And then things kind of just snowballed and took off from there. Um, I've gotten other other calls that I've applied to, but then I've also, you know, since then had a lot of commissions and had a lot of other people approach me or businesses approach me and ask, you know, hey, hey, can you, can we work together? And, you know, one of the things just to mention that Allison kind of pointed to was that I think a big part of, um, mural making and being successful in mural making is is really the relationship aspect of um the understanding the community that you're working with understanding who the client is 
um, understanding what the intent and purpose is for the work of art. You know, what is it that you want it to communicate and share? How does it work with the space that it lives in or the architecture or, um, and then beyond that, you know, what's the relationship with um, with the whoever you're working with or whoever's hiring you. And um, to me, it's really, that's a really vital and important part in the project and especially um, in making the project successful, um, both in your own experience as an artist, but also um, for whoever you're working with, you know, I think, and that, that will leave them with a positive experience and want to potentially, um, be a proponent for more work in the community. And I think that that is always a really important part of that, you know, is sometimes overlooked. Yeah, thank you, Daisy. And one of the things that uh, is really important to GCAC is that artists are paid, but artists understand their value and um, advocate, negotiate for their value. And that it seems to me that that relationship building is not only about the experience, but also setting those ground rules. Um, would you like to talk about that kind of need for some standardization, et cetera? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, just like any other industry, uh, especially the arts, the arts are, are a funny one because people can come in at all different levels and demand different prices. Um, but I think what's really important about this work is that we standardize and create a baseline so that even people, um, artists, young artists, or young artists who are just starting out in mural painting or in that industry have some understanding of, this is what I should be charging. And so they're not giving their work away for free because it's it's like any other industry, like. Um, like plumbers or electricians, there is a baseline for your skills and service, whether you're a journeyman or not. You know, it's it's um, it sets up the expectation for people who are working with you or hiring you to know and understand that there is a value for what they're asking for your for your labor, your time, your skills, and your talent. And um, that's incredibly important. And I think that's an incredibly important part of of when you're just starting out, you know, that, that, that there is an understanding that you, you're absolutely worth, um, worth, you know, your, your time and skills and effort. Um, Daisy, also one, something that you had said in a previous conversation was they're not just paying you to do a piece of art. So keeping in mind that you're managing a project and yeah. pricing it. Yeah, yeah, it's pricing. It's not just right. It's not just um, you know painting a piece of a piece of canvas or a wall. You know, it's it's project managing the entire thing from start to finish. It's also managing expectations. Your own, the client. Um, there's insurance. There are materials. There's equipment potentially. There are um, you know dealing with all the ins and outs of actually being on site in a location and what that means and looks like whether there are permits involved whether um um gosh i mean it's, the, it's endless but from the start to finish there's also in my mind you know it's 50 percent of the job is up front it's um the negotiation and then it's all of the design development which again is a huge part of and and in my opinion is sometimes almost the hardest part of the project is landing on the right design that everyone feels good about um and that often can take a lot of time and effort and back and forth and and all of that time should be accounted for so at the end of the day it's not just you know it might take you a few days on site painting a wall, but at the end of the day, it's not, that's not, you know, the whole project. Um, and to, no, go ahead. To touch on that as well, um, very well said, Daisy, uh, that, that intent that we talked about a little bit earlier in, in the design aspect of it and what you're going to be talking to the building business owners about and what you are creating as an artist can be so much bigger uh, if you look down to the like woke three was saying the neighborhood he was in and the history that he wanted to present and then doing that research to find a face or a name or a logo from 100 years ago or 50 years ago and how you want to create this whole story that you're telling is so much bigger and and all of that should be incorporated into the price guide um i think somebody said something about hourly and 
uh, what was that comment? I think somebody said something about the charge by hourly or uh, foot square footage. So like you like uh, so yes, having a like a, some kind of standard for we're not just giving us our work away. Like I know that um, for me, I, I would always hear from like my professors or folks who are doing who've been doing murals and things longer than me. They would say, you know, the 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 minimum rate that we would normally maybe start out with is twenty dollars a square foot. And you know, if you feel like you don't feel as comfortable charging that, you can go down to fifteen dollars a square foot. Um, and then just as your experience, as you gain experience, and as you you know uh, get more uh, of your portfolio, um, as you go up your portfolio, you can start to charge more than um, than that. And as far as like even you know you putting like fifty percent of the work, I mean you're doing the research, the um, creating the design, everything like that. I mean, that's why normally I would um, say at fifty percent of the the total cost needs to be up front for us to start the mural. Or if they want to, you know, just want to see a design, how, how much, like what what would this look like? What is the mock-up that you can charge a deposit fee for that? So whatever your deposit would be for your digital design or painting or whatever you're gonna use for your mock-up, you just charge them. Hey, this is what my fee is gonna be for that. And then, you know, add, that'll be added on to the total price, the total cost. And then once we get to that, that's 50 percent of that, whatever's remaining, because I have to get I have to actually get materials. I have to actually get the project started. So. Can I can I add to that pricing conversation? Because I think, you know, I think exactly just to add on to what you're saying, I think there's so many factors involved, too, that aren't often thought about. Um, so it's I also think it's not just a as straightforward as, you know, this range of $15 to $45 a square foot or whatever it is, which I feel like that's a pretty good range from low end to high end um, for artists, like an all in kind of fee. Um, but I, and plus the design, of course, as Woke 3 mentioned. But I think the other aspect too, like it's not just the, it's not just where you're at in your career. Um, it is other factors like whether equipment is needed, whether the surface of the wall is going to be primed or prepped for you. Is it a brick wall that's never been painted on? Do you, you know, is it going to require a lot of prep? Is it, um, what sort of materials does it need? Um, does it need to be clear coated? You know, there is, is it an accessible space? Um, is it really difficult to get in and out of, you know, just even there, there's sometimes weird spaces that you, you can only access with the ladder or, um, you know, there are all these other factors that, in, that, that affect like how easy it is to actually physically paint um, a space and that it, and again then complexity of the design like that's another aspect um, so there are all of these different things aside from simply the square footage of a wall that I think are really important factors to consider when you are pricing um, these projects too um, so it's again it may not be like oh I'm just starting out I'm going to start it on this low end um, it might be, yeah, I'm just starting out, but this is a really complex project, um, and I'm going to price it based on based on that. Yeah, thank you for adding that, Daisy. I mean, I think um, thinking about the scope of work, the whole bit of scope of work, more than just how how big the wall is. Um, we did get a question, and I, and, and Woke Three might want to answer this. Uh, what's a good scale or range for a digital design mock-up or concept? Uh, as far as the uh, a range, I I really kind of how I started was I started off with a hundred dollars for a sketch. I mean, I I didn't really have any kind of like kind of uh, system to figure that out. I just thought, you know, I'm creating this design, this sketch for you. How much would I charge for at least a drawing? And and then it got more complex where I when I got more equipment because I was like, well, now I have a computer where I can do a digital mockup, so I can. Create a, create a design digitally, or I could do a watercolor or something like that. So now, I, so now at this point, I charge five hundred for uh, the, uh, uh, the that's a deposit. So once we so that way, if we do a design, I don't have to feel beat up if we don't decide to go with it. It's like okay, well at least I got you know five hundred from that, and I can keep moving, or we keep going, and all it is is just going to go into the total cost of what's already being paid for the design. Go ahead, Brooks. Um, <clears throat> for those who are starting out, I would recommend starting with really basic designs. 
So that will save your time and your energy. And in dealing with, with business owners, even more than building owners, giving them less things to nitpick at. Uh, I even encourage artists to do black and white um, so they can't say, well, I'd rather have this flower be red instead of blue and this and that. It just gives them, you just want that, that general concept of what's going to be happening. And that gives you a lot more freedom when you're actually painting uh, to use your creativity. Can I add to you as well? I think another important thing in, in design development is also telling the story. So creating the design, but a lot of a lot of people who are hiring you want to understand the art on the page. Um, and it doesn't have to be complex or deep or philosophical in any way, but it's like they just want to understand your thought process and why, you know, it's like I might paint flowers, but I'll talk about the community aspect of what it's communicating or where it's coming from for me, because sometimes that bridge is missing. Um, and it's really helpful for people to understand or stakeholders to understand what that vision is. And that oftentimes will help them get on board with if different aspects of your design when they better understand it from that storytelling perspective. Yeah, so what I hear you saying is kind of using both sides of your brain, right? So you're going to map out the logistics and the conversations with the client, but also getting them on board with the passion and the story behind the art. Um, that kind of naturally leads us on to um, contracts. And I'll preface it by saying there's a lot to think about. Um, and just some of the things that I have on my list are, you know, right away, permits, street closures, equipment rentals, insurance, the right first right of refusal, if they're gonna remove or take down the art. What bathroom access and access to water do you have on site for the work? Which is something I wouldn't have thought of. Um, all of the staging, right? All of those things you need to think about. The contract is there to protect you and also the client and in that, you can delineate who's responsible for what so nothing gets dropped. Um, I'm going to have Brooks start that conversation on contracts. Thanks, Allison. Um, I hate contracts, so let's start off by saying that. It's one of my weakest points as an administrator. Um, but I found that uh, they're so, so important. Uh, so what we do for the festivals, we have three different contracts, and I'm usually the facilitator between a nonprofit uh, that that works with a city element, and then is the main go between between the artist and then the business owner and then the building owner. So we have a contract between um, myself as a representative of the of the nonprofit. So for instance, Sierra Arts Foundation will have a contract with Woke Three as an artist, and that will stipulate um, both persons' expectations as simply as possible. And then, and in our contract, it's very artist friendly, um, <clears throat> including the copyright staying with the artist. And then we have one that's very basic for the, if it's two separate owners for the building and the business, business we have the business owner just sign off that they're um, giving permission for the design. And then we have the building owner have a, a little more specific contract um, <clears throat> that they're giving permission for the painting. And then some more specific things. We have a three year, clause that the building that the the mural will be maintained for three years and that's just for them that's language for them to know that they do have some responsibilities we've had only in the eight years i've been doing this we've only had two tags uh and that's over that's probably close to 250 murals that we've helped with i uh, only had two tags and one didn't have to do with the art it was somebody who was released from prison and wanted to go back to prison. So he drove to the closest mural and tagged it and then drank beer while he was waiting for the police to come pick him up. Um, <laughs> so, so to let them know that tagging is not really an issue, it's the opposite, of course, as we all know, uh, but to let them know that if they, that there is some responsibility for them. And then after three years, to, we asked them to let uh, myself or that nonprofit know if they're going to paint over it. In some cases, we've been able to move move murals, uh, or at least have the artist be able to, if they want to keep the mural, explain why they want to keep it, and have that conversation. So uh, these pieces of art don't disappear uh, without anyone knowing. <clears throat> of course, everything is temporary. Uh, we also like to stress that. 
uh, in the mural world. Uh, but we found that having these contracts done early as well, and then we pay the artist 50% upon uh, approval of the design. And sometimes that can be months before the event happens, but uh, it's always, uh, we found it easier also to break up those payments. So if we're asking the business building owners uh, for $5,000, it's a little bit easier to ask them for like a $500 design and then half up and then the other half, uh, breaking it up makes it much easier for them to, to contemplate paying a, a larger uh, fee. Go ahead, Daisy, you have something to add about contracts? Yeah, I think, um, you know, another, just to add to that, I think putting in explicit language about maintenance is really important. That's usually a question that comes up um, for people. And I think um, always, always just, I'm just stressing this, always maintain your copyright as an artist um, as much as possible. And what I like to do is, say you know there's licensing and usage rights if you know like if they want to use it for personal use or for promotion or they want to take photographs because it's their building and their space that's fine um as long as they're not like making money off of the image itself um but i think as much as possible try to maintain that copyright and if that does come into question i always kind of mention hey that's a negotiation we can we can have that's separate from the project itself um, so I think that's really important. I just wanted to mention that. And, and of course, um, I think insurance is another, and I don't know if we're, if we're going to get into that, but I think making sure insurance is outlined, um, in those agreements, um, there was one other thing, but now I can't remember what it is. Yeah. I, I mean, let's dig a little bit deeper into insurance. I know most artists don't really love that topic. It's like right up there with contracts. Um, but, uh, having, uh, some history in that, Daisy, maybe you can share a little bit of, you know, what you know about um, the insur getting insurance, not just the why, but the how. Yeah. Um, so it's actually a pretty easy process, especially, I mean, if you have renters or homeowners or anything, typically if you have an agent, you can talk to them about um about insurance for whatever it is you're doing. And, and you know, even like the second mural I ever did required insurance. It was um, a project that was with the Milwaukee downtown, our Milwaukee downtown business improvement district. Um, they required insurance. I just kind of, it was built into the budget in that way. Um, general liability insurance is not that crazy expensive, to be honest. I mean, and it's, and it can really cover you. And my insurance covers my business. It covers my studio and everything in it, as well as all of the jobs that I'm on. Um, it doesn't include equipment typically. So that's something that when you're renting equipment, you wanna make sure that you are covered there. Um, if I were to damage something with the equipment I'm using, then I would be covered. But if the equipment itself is damaged, um, that is not covered. So those are important things to just understand when you are getting into that kind of territory of using um, heavy machinery. But yeah, it's it's a pretty, I mean, it's honestly a pretty easy process, but I think this, the earlier you can get insurance, which is why I recommend to people who are getting into mural making in a really serious way, um, Typically, you can get better rates the more time you have to kind of shop around. Um, so, you know, if you think you might be doing something that needs that, kind of ha start having that conversation earlier than later. There are also sometimes projects, so I know like this is speaking from Artist Uprising and um, we, off we also carry like a $5 million policy as a company that can cover artists under, that we are working with and hiring and contracting with. So um, that's, often a really great way that if artists are not able to or don't have their own, we can provide a additional or a little extra coverage for them while they're doing projects with us. So there are some other ways around um, around that conversation or that issue if it if it is something that comes up depending on, but it's definitely one that if you are contracting with anyone in a serious way, especially developers, they're they're going to absolutely require it. And the same if you're, a lot of these projects will be with some sort of a nonprofit or neighborhood group, city group, and they're gonna require it as well. And it's usually really easy if, you, if you're if you not at that point um, 
to have that full insurance, like Daisy was talking about, which is a great idea. If you're not quite there yet, it's really easy for the business to just add you to theirs during the project. And it's it's a nominal fee. It's under $100 um, in Nevada to do that uh, for a week or so. Uh, so that's the easy way to keep yourself protected. Um, we have a question here and Hunter, I'm not ignoring your question. We'll get to yours, but this, this one leads us into the next part. Um, Jennifer Jordan asked, what point can the community get involved to assist with painting? So thinking about the community engagement, also backing up to, and I don't know what it's like in some of your other cities, but what do you need as far as um, even beyond the permits, kind of the um, the buy-in that you need from the neighborhood commissions? Is there a, a, a city commission that needs to take a look at your plans, making sure that you think about that? So. Woke three, do you have anything you like to add to that conversation about community engagement? Mm -hmm. So, as far as when I'm when I'm doing certain murals or in, um, in neighborhoods, and depending on that topic, like so, we'll do murals that specifically um, um, relate to this neighborhood, and we want to get folks, and it's large enough, but we want to get folks involved, and it's safe enough too, because you don't want anything that's just kind of dangerous to to paint on. But this mural makes this this space right here makes sense for community members to come in and create. Um, what it does, it just helps if you want to be able to, you know, get get folks involved and um, get a buy in for your mural, get the community to be able to because you're painting this in in a neighborhood. It makes sense to be able to get if you if it's the, depending on what it is, you want to get folks involved with it so they can feel like they're a part of it. And this mural becomes some, a landmark or becomes ingrained to the community. I think it, um, the community can get involved, like I said, any time that the the that it makes sense, that the wall makes sense, that that they can get involved. And as far as the arts commission, I usually, um, well, as far as Metro Arts, they usually get involved in, if we're involving them as far as getting funding. Um, but I mean, we've done murals just like the Legacy mural. Well, we didn't get any funding from Metro Arts or anything like that. Um, and it was a, a really large mural. We got we just basically reached out to the community. We knocked on doors. Uh, we reached out to other organizations that we knew of. Um, it's in my neighborhood. So, of course, I'm going I'm going around talking to people that I know or people I've seen for years. I'm, or I'm asking their kids and things that they want to get involved or I'm taking pictures. And this is the way I always involve communities wherever I'm painting that I take pictures of people who are living around that neighborhood you know who might you might walk up and down the street and i just stop you and say let me take a picture i'm putting this i'm putting folks on this mural and i want to add you into it and so that's a way i get people involved so i just really it's i mean even if it's not planned to be a community um com community um project i mean you might just meet just getting involved with the community you might just meet folks and somebody might come up and say hey i want to be a, a muralist and you involve them onto the wall as long as it's safe as as long as everything is safe and everything like that, then yeah, you get you get folks involved. So I think it's always a good time like, as long as everything is is safe. So can I add to that? I think um, just there are a couple of really great ways too. You can engage community members. Um, in some ways, it's like in the designing part of it, you know, before physically painting, which again, the painting part is the fun part. So that's one way you can even before you even start the project. And then another way I think that is really kind of a fun way um, that I was introduced to more recently in, in the last few years is a product called Polytab. So if anyone out there, the other muralists are familiar with Polytab, it's, um, it's called parachute cloth, it's called um, interfacing it comes from the textile world it's essentially polyester fabric that's like paper that can be printed on that can be painted on um, i've done murals in my studio on like five foot panels of this stuff and then you you almost paste it onto the wall with uh with an acrylic medium so it's a way where you can kind of control the situation so it is safe if it's not a location where where community members can actually paint. They can physically paint or help paint these panels um, in an indoor 
space or in any space, and then they can be installed. Um, so it can be designed in a way too, where people can kind of like, um, community members can kind of put their own flair on different pieces of the mural. And then you can, you know, as the artist can be the one to kind of curate how that um, works out in the composition. So that can be a really fun way um, to have people physically um, being a part of it. Um, and then just to add on to the approvals and, and associations and commissions, I think, I think one of the biggest areas that comes up is when there's a historical commission or a historical um, association in the community, or if it's a historical area where the buildings physically have a lot of limitations or um, guidelines on what you can do to them. And I'll give you an example. The first mural that I painted, um, it's in a space called Black Hat Alley here in Milwaukee on the east side. Um, the built, so the, the mural, real quick, the mural that I was commissioned to paint was actually painting over a piece that was painted previously that was then um, not received well by the community. It was a divisive kind of piece. It was then um, graffitied on as a result, as a statement. And then um, beyond that, it was painted over, it was graffitied on again. And then that's when I came in to paint the mural to kind of, you know, to, to rectify the what it had become within that time frame, which is again was a very short time frame of, you know, a few months or two a year. Um, the building that it was on became a historical building, which then meant that no paint could be, it couldn't be painted on. Um, so we had to install panels. We had to get really creative around. You know, it had to be panels that were placed that could only be attached in the mortar, um, not through the brick. And it was very, it was a silly situation because it then entombed this graffitied mural <laughs> forever historically as part of the building. Um, so it's like, you know, there are some absurd kind of hoops to jump through. Um, and that, that's just one example. There, are, Those things tend to come up when you do this sort of work. Um, but there are sometimes architectural committees, but but I think it just really depends on the community that you're working in. And, um, but that does, definitely does happen and sometimes can hang up the project. And I've had projects that have, have gone nowhere because um, that we've run into um, different associations or committees that just did not wanna see art in their community. <laughs> That's a really great and very extreme, <laughs> scary example of all the hoops you had to jump through. But I, I appreciate you talking about that because I also think that we sometimes forget that there's layers of humanity. And when there are humans involved, it, it, at any point, it can become a little more complex. I would just want to add, not being muralist, but being on the other side is to Woke Three's point, it's never too early. It's always the right time to engage your community. A lot of times, property owners immediately think of, let's get the whole community to paint this thing together. But you can equally have their voices portrayed without them literally having to do any of the, the specific artwork. So getting the buy-in from the neighbors is huge. We have some examples in Columbus where we have kind of uh, steered uh, with good intentions. Um, but for example, there was uh, somebody who bought a business, bought a building. There was a mural on there. This is in the Sohud area, if you guys are familiar with it. Um, and they painted over the mural that was there, which had been a collaborative community painting. Um, and they put up what they thought was this really great gra graffiti art and the neighborhood blew up. Like just, it was horrible. Um, so just having the time to go out as uh, you know encouraging the property owners to make sure that they've they've kind of thought through the presence in the community their role in the community you as the artist getting more you know continuing to talk to people and um one thing that we see here is and i'm sure you guys love this part of it but you know people who just are walking down the street and see you working and want to have the conversation with you i mean what an amazing opportunity to get their feedback get their store their history History of, of you know their presence in the city, et cetera. So I'm just going to reiterate that it's never too late. It's always the right thing to do at every point. We have a couple questions in here, and um, we had intentionally left, decided to leave a lot of time for questions. So um, 
we may move a, a little less flu, you know, linearly in this this next part, but I wanted to get to a couple of the questions and have the artists um, uh, respond. So, Hunter, if you're just starting out to keep it manageable, should we scale figures, portraits up larger rather than add multiple characters scenarios? Okay. Can I, see. Can I you, go ahead? Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. I was plugging my charger in anyway. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I I think that's a really great question. And I think there's two parts, I would say two parts to that. I think definitely if you're just starting out, choose something that you feel confident, but maybe just be pushing, pushing yourself a little bit. Um, where you're like, because I think that there is always a scary aspect, even now that I have experienced. And, and part of that is that you're walking into a different scenario every time. So it's always problem solving. It's always different. You're always learning things on the fly. Um, but given that, it's like, yeah, I think choose a work that you feel confident that you can execute well, especially if it is your first. And whether that means it's fewer figures or more, I don't know that I can fully answer that question for you. But I think what's important is, more important almost, is thinking about the composition and how it lives in the space. And does it make most sense for it to be a scaled up single portrait? Or does it make more sense for it to be several, several people? And what you know, like what fits best in that space and the intent for and the intent of that of that piece of art. Um, I think that is almost a more important aspect of it being a successful project and, ex and a su successful work than, um, you know, like how does that composition work versus um, does it, you know, should it, I don't, does that make, I don't know if that answers just the question, but I feel like. He's, it, he's nodding not, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's not an either. Maybe it's it's not an either or. I think it's a. I think it's a. It depends on you know what the project is and what the wall is and what you feel comfortable with. Mhm. Mm and I think, because uh, uh, I because I I, I I remember thinking about that when I first kind of started, really um, doing a lot more murals. I was thinking, well, if I you know if I do, you know, my first real big piece was just a single figure. But head and shoulders, long hair and things, and I kind of that way I feel like okay, this would be easier to do. But I remember an artist coming and saying, "Man, you had all of that space. You know, I really love the mural, but man, you could have pushed even harder on that." And I remember thinking about that, and I remember and and thinking like, "Yes, like that's an opportunity to kind of push hard." And, and sometimes you end up stepping in something that's like, "Man, I don't know if you know this is a pretty big space or this this is a complicated design, but." When you push yourself, you'd be surprised at what ends up coming out of it. So and you'll be you'll be like so grateful to see the end result. So pushing that pushing yourself is really gonna be be where you, where you want to be. Uh, you both make absolutely amazing points. Um, <clears throat> thinking about the murals as as a public art aspect that people are going to be viewing them. Uh, from different places. Some pieces will never be seen that up close. There'll be bigger walls. Some pieces will only be seen up close. So you can think about whether that, that negative space is going to be impactful in the story you're telling, or if you can do uh, some color pops that would also help tell a story, but also fill up some of that space that would be uh, both time and uh, budget wise. Does that help, Hunter? Oh, go ahead, Daisy. Well, I don't, I just wanted to mention, I don't know, um, this pops into my mind. This, there's an artist, Chase McClaim, if any of you have heard of him. Um, I'm sorry, Case McClaim. I don't know why. I, said, <laughs> I just like, <laughs> something happened there in my brain. Case McClaim is an incredible artist. And he, <laughs> Alice is laughing at me. Um, he only really paints one figure or hands or like it's one thing but he does it on an incredible scale with incredible detail and his work is just it's it's so good and it's usually so mesmerizing and it really holds the space but he's he's you he's selecting the content and the work and designing it so that it fits the space well 
Um, and I, again, that just to reiterate my point, I think, you know, like he's pushing the boundaries in a totally different way, but it's not necessarily by adding more things. It's, it's creatively using the space and creatively using the content. Um, and it still is, I think, pushing pushing boundaries for himself and just in the art form in general. So that's all. Thank you. That that was um very rich depth, adding depth to that part of the conversation. Um, I'm gonna continue with Hunter. Would polytab be removable per, per, for preserving or moving? And would that still meet GCAC standards? Well, uh, our standards are brand new. So, um, so yes, um, and that's, that's what you would, it would depend, depend on what you as the artist and the property owner have agreed upon. Um, we uh, pretty much say we don't want it to be in the in our particular mural arts assistance grants we don't want temporary in the sense we don't want chalk art we don't you know we want it to be as permanent as it can be in a mural setting in a city where things might change but yes it would um but let's ask uh i don't know about the polytab being removable um i don't know that it's removable i'm going to say in my opinion, I think polytab is almost more permanent than paint on the wall. And it it also, the color can be vo more vibrant and actually lasts longer, in my opinion. That's my that's my ex limited experience. Um, so I don't know. I don't have a good answer for removal. I'm not I'm not entirely sure. But maybe somebody else does. Yeah. I, go ahead, Brooks. Oh, you go ahead, walk through. Well, I was going to say, yeah, I don't, I don't think it is really removable um, to, to where you can preserve it. I've seen a lot of artists that who are using it, whose work is still up and it's still colorful. Um, but nobody, I've never heard anybody actually taking it off. Um, so I'm not sure if it would be. I think um, the process is that is that once it adheres to the wall after a couple of weeks, it's like it actually kind of, I don't know, combines with the wall a little bit. Like it kind of infuses itself into that. So it becomes that. I'm, I haven't used or worked with an artist that's used the poly tab, but I have worked with some large scale pieces that are more on the wheat paste element with paper and then using a, they use a, a bullfrog and it's like hair gel you apply to the wall and then the paper and then another layer. And, and I've the last one, uh, Chip Thomas, who's out of Arizona, Jet Sonorama, if you want to look him up, does amazing. Uh, he he only does wheat paste. Um, before the last building was torn down that he did in Reno, it was up for six years and still was fabulous. So I think, and it was not removable at all. And I would, from the little I know about Polly, uh, you're not going to be able to transfer that. It's it's a one and done. But but all those have really good length to them if you use them the right substrate and prep work and all that. Very good question. Um, from Sarah, are there liability insurance concerns you should factor in with community engagement or even with an assistant? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I think I think that's that's the big challenge when you're with community engagement in in any on any project. And that's why I I mean, I personally typically don't have people help unless they are you know they're co contracted by me or you know i i think that's one of the tricky parts again that's why i think polytab is a great um solution because you can have a community event in a space that you know is that set up for that and um really control all of those variables that could potentially be dangerous i would second the yes to having insurance for other people for the city events that we've done, it's a universal uh, two million, and that covers attendees to the event. And we always have a, a piece that the community is encouraged to paint on in some fashion or another. And so it would cover those people who are helping to paint in some aspect. It also covers volunteers. And then we do walking tours during the event, and it covers attendees for the walking tours as well. So usually those policies are pretty universal. 
Good, yeah, just the, the reminder that insurance and contracts are about protecting yourself and protecting others. Um, so uh, there is another question here. Who do you contact to ask if you can paint on a building other than the business owner? The city's commerce, question mark. I would say don't contact the city for first, second, or third. They would be your last resort if you want to paint on it, or unless it's a city building. But in most cases, I wouldn't involve the city in any aspect of your mural um, unless it's their property. Yes, I, I probably always. Um, anytime it's a property owner, I just contact them. It just be easier. Uh, once you involve the city and everything like that, they have certain things that they don't want or something. I mean, it's just a whole process. Like if it's a city, if it's city property, yeah, you contact the city. But if it's if it's a private owner, then it's just talking to them. And sometimes they may may or may not be with it. But you know, it's it's an easier process when you when you work with them. <laughs> Good sage advice. Not first, second, or third. Um, the in in Columbus, the time that you uh, if you've worked out with the property owner. If it's within the city of Columbus, um, often there is uh, the Columbus Art Commission, which is separate from GCAC. It's actually an, uh, a department and entity of the city. And essentially, they just make sure that you're meeting particular guidelines. So, for example, the mural can't have advertisement or, it, you know, it has to be a certain height or things like that. Individual neighborhood commissions might have those same sites sort of requirements. It's always good whether whether they have to bless your project or not to go to a commission meeting in the neighborhood where the the um, property is so that they can get excited about it and be um, be advocates and ambassadors for you. So um, if that helps answer your question, city would be later in the process. And to go back to that real quick, if you're looking for money, then that's a whole different subject. Then you would want to contact the city and a neighborhood advisory board is what they call them here is a good way to start. Um, if you're like, this is a small town, so you could see the mayor at the grocery store, you know, all the city council people, uh, you can find one of them. They all have discretionary funds. So we've had several murals here. Then an artist went to Naoma and said, hey, Naoma, I want to do this wall and it's in your ward and can I, are uh, sometimes the city can be a real benefit or an asset uh, but i still say it's your third best asset yeah and i, I just want to reiterate leslie responded to and you guys may have, are reading this but i like to say uh, talk about it too just make sure that you're not working in a district that has design restrictions in some historic restriction uh, historic districts uh, the design needs to be approved by a committee. Um, one example that it's not a historic district, but uh, Mad Lab, which has a building downtown on um, Third, they uh, they own their building and they were uh, hiring murals to put artwork on. And one of the uh, mock-ups had the um, tragedy, whatever um, theater face. And that was considered to be too tied to what was happening inside the building. So they had to rework the design. So there's weird things like that that you just want to be aware of and not waste your time or money um, by not pulling them in. Go ahead, Daisy. Yeah, no, I think that's really, I just want to add, <laughs> add to that because I think whenever there's an open call, um, and there, and it's tied to businesses who are providing their spaces or their walls as opportunities. Inevitably, there are always people who try, like if it's a, if it's like a taco restaurant, they will make a mural with tacos in it, which will automatically get you disqualified from the bat because it's considered signage, you know? So just, it's nev never, 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 <laughs> never walk that line because it's just never going to work. Um, next question, when it comes to wall prep, to prime or not to prime? Um, 
if the wall, so this is Hunter's question, he, the wall I'm envisioning is already a flat dark gray. Is that helpful or problematic depending on the color hues chosen? What base colors or prep do each of you prefer? So I, I if the wall has been painted before, I may not prime unless the wall needs to be um, like, let's say there's chipping paint. There's chipping paint I have to take off or there's, there's things I need to cover up. Um, but I sometimes, if I do want to prime and I ended up priming in a color that's going to be related to whatever I'm painting, like if it's a dark blue or something I'm going to use for shadow, uh, I paint the whole wall in dark blue or something and build out of that. But it kind of just depends on that preference or whatever that color kind of, because when you do lay out, lay out a color, like paint on a canvas, when you lay a color out first, you can kind of also out build off of that color. So, you know, that's, that's just preference. But, um, I prime, I try to make sure the wall is in good condition before I, before I start painting, because you don't want areas um, like, let's say, chip paint. You don't want to paint on an area that, and, um, and then the paint somebody peels your painting off because you didn't prep the wall. You got to clean. If it's chipped, you got to clean the wall off, scrape all that off as much as you can, and then prime it. So there is prep work that goes into that, which you can add into your budget when you're somebody's paint, you know, um, paying you for a wall is. You know, this is a part of the budget. I have to do a wall prep. I have to prime this wall before I can actually get started. Yeah, can I add to that? I think it also um, it depends on what type of paint you work with. So if you're using acrylic brush paint or if you are a spray paint artist only or um, those are different factors, too. I think definitely all around if you want your colors to be super saturated, bright and long lasting um, priming is definitely key for longevity. But again, it comes down to the budget. Oftentimes, unfortunately, that is like a part that can get cut. I think priming and clear coating are really Im important parts, but if the budget is really limited, one of those typically gets cut out. Um, and I think, um, gosh, I just, I just totally lost my train of thought. There was something <laughs> else you said woke that reminded me, but now I don't know what it is. Yeah, colors with with certain colors or oh damn I try to help you out. <laughs> I'll jump in while you're thinking, um, and that could be something that you cover in your contract as well. Uh, we have wall prep in some of our con in some of our contracts, and depending on the organizations you're working with, um, cities have those big water trucks that they use to wash graffiti off of things. So we've had them go and wash big walls for us. And usually they're happy to do those kind of things to get the projects going. Uh, and that would even include priming a lot of times. We're, the one we're doing next month, we're gonna have several walls primed by the property management company before the artists come in. That's exactly what I was gonna say. I was gonna say prep, and then I was gonna add from before anything like prep, priming, permits, um, any of that kind of stuff, like as much as possible, try and have whoever you're working with, handle that. If you can contract, write that into the contract, um, that that's being handled by, by everyone else, even like equipment rental oftentimes, if you can get that written in um, on the other end, whoever's hiring you, that's, that's really beneficial and helpful. What other questions do you all have? Look, we have these three experts and we still have more time. Um, Go Hunter, I see Hunter's ready to type. I see some questions about asking the clarification on what is signage. Um, what's the difference between signage and art? So that's like a city, like that's a city thing typically because you have to pay a fee if you're putting signage up on a business um, because it's considered some kind of advertisement. Um, so I don't know the exact like you know, I don't I don't know what those guidelines are exactly, but typically if it's a business and you have an image of something related to the business, kind of like what Allison said before with the theater mask, um, if it's a theater or, you know, or if it's a performing arts group or again, like if it's a restaurant of some sort and it has food, you know, that's related in in the even if it's art and even if it doesn't say the name of the business it can still lean into that signage territory and that often um, kind of disqualifies it from being 
able to live as just a mural. Um, but to answer your question, Hunter, like if it's if you're painting walls on a school and you add young people, that that's I mean, a school is a community kind of space that's totally different. So you can ab that in my mind that you can absolutely do that. And I don't think signage for a school is even it's a to, to me, that's a totally different territory. So I think we're talking about like private businesses more often. That's a great question. I'm glad we came back to it. And that is just because cities want to charge the businesses. It's all down. It comes down to the money. Um, but, but if you want to paint tacos on a taco shop, you can make a lot of money doing that as well. So that could be an avenue uh, where you want to start doing those. And and doing lettering for signage is a lost art. If you're good at that and enjoy doing that, that's another way you can make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, sign uh, painting. Um, do we just want to keep rolling through the? Yeah, the, yeah. So I was gonna say, um, Eric, uh, I'm gonna hold yours just for a bit, Eric Martin, because we'll we'll kind of maybe wrap up on that. But for Phyllis, what kind of permits are we talking about? And then Hunter has a whole a bunch of questions. Oh, good, we got we got questions. What kind of permits are we talking about? Someone else want to tackle that, or I, yeah, Brooks, you want to? Daisy, you might be the most qualified for that, but I'll talk about the little bit I know about it. Uh, it's going to vary a lot um, depending on where you're painting. Sometimes you'll need sidewalk access. Sometimes you'll need road access. So those are the big ones that we've uh, done with the city stuff is closing sidewalks and closing roads, which normally normally it's more about communication than anything else so that businesses or other entities will know what's going on and can work around it. A lot of the places that we've been able to paint, it doesn't even come down to money. They're happy to do it. The cities are happy to close those sidewalks. They just want to make sure that it's safe uh, for everyone who's going to be around that area during the event. Uh, those are the two the permitting that I, comes to my mind first. Yeah, I would say that that's what comes to my mind as well. And that's those are the experiences that I've had. It's it's in any right of way or or street closure that you'd have to make um, that would affect traffic. Um, you you also have to consider renting um, traffic regulated regulation. You know, whether it's barricades, whether it's having flaggers, depending on again the street. And those are again costs that can be exponential depending on the time amount of time it, it takes. So those are factors that really should be considered, but definitely um, right of ways or having plans for if you're taking up with equipment or space or blocking anything. Um, typically, it's there is a cost for those permits. And again, it's um, because cities are trying to make some money in the process. And another one just popped into mind because I have to deal with it this week. Uh, so this little town, Fernley, another town of 20,000 people, we did a big event last year. We're doing a smaller event this year. Uh, it's the only city in northern Nevada we've worked with where the city requires the muralists to have a business license. So they have to sign up for a business license and pay that $70 because they're what they say is they're performing work in the city. Therefore, they have to have a business license from the city, which also drives me crazy. Um, and why it should be your third option when you talk to the city so yeah that sounds like some maybe there's some antiquated uh policy that they're just looking at the bottom line of the cash coming in um so hunter has questions can you cover the pros and cons of the traditional grid doodle grid uh, attempting to use a projector in an outside environment or just capture with an ipad um I can talk about the gridding. Um, so I've seen people do some doodle grids. I've never done a grid um, before, but I've seen people um, doing some doodle grids and they and um, and the concept um, explain the concept to me makes uh, makes sense and everything. I think for what I've done is for my murals that are like the really big ones. I usually, if I have the design already um, created. I work on, I sketch out focused on one part or one aspect of the design, which I know will help me um, scale everything else. So if it's one big figure in it, it's surrounded by a bunch of other things, then I focus on that one big figure. And I know compared to that piece, I know these fit right here. 
And then I just basically, as I'm creating, I'm putting like anchor points almost. Like I, I sketch out a gesture sketch of the big figure. I'm doing some pieces over there. And based on all of that, once you start to pull it together, it starts to become easier to actually pull the mural together because you you can kind of tell where I know that this is, isn't as big as that, but I know it sits right here next to this. So it kind of helps out. And as far as the iPad, I think I, and I, wouldn't, I don't know if I understood that part of the question. I usually do capture the wall on my iPad and then transfer it to my computer and design on top of that. Um, and then I show them, yeah, I show them that design and then we just go based off of that. Can I add, um, so I've done, I've done a traditional grid, I've done a doodle grid, I've done um, poly tab where it's ghost printed and then I've painted it in the studio and then installed it and it's like, you know, it's all, they're all labeled. Um, and then I've also done projector. Um, so there's, I think what I like to do typically is it depend, depending on the space and what is best for the space, use that approach. Um, Projector can be really finicky sometimes. I've done projectors in outdoor spaces um, at night. Again, you have to have power, so that's an issue. If you have power, great. If you don't and you don't want to, you don't have a generator. That's you know it can get cumbersome to set those things up. Um, but I think doodle grids are awesome. Um, I that's my my probably favorite way to transfer a design if I don't have a projector or access to a projector. Um, again, I lean on projectors simply because it's like I've already I've already I've already drawn this once. I don't you know, I don't have to draw it again. And if it's a matter of time, if it's there's travel involved and I don't you know want to spend that time, that's often very quick and easy. Um, but doodle words are awesome because um, you it's really fun. The first thing, it's really fun to just doodle on a wall. And then when you overlay the image, um, if you are working with assistants or other people, it provides far more points, cross points and reference points in your image to help direct where other people should be working. Because you can, when you're using a traditional grid, you can so quickly like count off or get off on the wrong square and then it throws the whole thing off, especially when you're working really, really huge. And that's, you know, I've that's happened to me before working on like an 80 foot by 50 foot wall. And, you know, and my grid is like four feet by four feet and you get off one and then it's just, you know, it can it can sort of snowball from there. Um, but yeah, I think that that's a great question. And hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight. As, as far as the projector, yes, like I always recommend using the projector, especially if you're doing like I've seen people kind of try to mimic folks logos, business owners logos without using a projector or something like that. And it's, it's like it makes sense if the design needs specifically to be this way and you don't want to have to draw too much of it out, then the projector is the best way to go, because that way you can project it and then just, you know, keep going without having to worry about does this the right size and everything like that. It just especially for logos especially for logos logos and words yes my recommendation words. is get a high lumen projector because you can work in even in light like light situations not maybe like daylight but do, you know before it gets dark um and short throw which are far more expensive but if you get to that point and you can get a high lumen short throw projector um, that is also can come in really handy because you you don't need the same amount of depth um, to project a large scale. Oh, sorry. Do you recommend any specific weatherproof sealants? Who wants to take uh, clear? Oh, I. <laughs> uh, I don't. I only use like Vandal Vandal Guard. So Vandal Guard, I've I've heard from other muralists say that's that's good, but I'm not really that versed in the clear coating. I would just make sure to um, when you're getting the coat, try to ask questions about what this is good at protecting, um, and just as much as you can learn about that that coat when you first get it from the store or wherever you're buying it from. I think if you can use. Again, if you're using acrylic latex paint, outdoor 
exterior paint or you're using spray paint, um, then I typically get water-based acrylic clear coats as well. Um, I There's a product called SureClear 1K. It's a acrylic water-based um, exterior clear coat. It's it's a it comes in a couple different sheens. It's a Sherwin Williams product. I've used that a lot. Um, it's great when you spray it on, but again, it's like it depends on the surface you're working on. There are marine based clear coats that you can use um, if you really need like to seal it or need protection if it's in like a high salt, high water like area. But again, like there are there are down you know there are downfalls with these types of products as well like marine based coatings they're sticky they're horrible to work with they can often change the look of your your work of art um, every time I clear coat a project it's like the scariest part of the project um, and they can yellow they can yellow over time they can yellow the white colors or the light colors um, so again like it's that's a hard one just because there are so many projects products out there um, I would also suggest um, modern masters makes a really good clear coat that's water that's acrylic as well um, and yeah that's that I think is like more trial and error trial, trial and error too like what you prefer to use just like with any art products um, try different things see what you might like but those are my recommendations uh, we have about 10 minutes left, and so I'm going to try and get through these questions. Um, uh, Pamela is interested in the poly tab. Can it be cut into shapes, sewn together to make a really large work? Yeah, so um, poly tab can definitely be cut. So what's fun about it is you can cut it into any shape. You can cut it into birds and then paste birds onto something. You could paint a wall, cut shapes and then paste those onto the painting you can layer it it takes on the form and the surface of any and the texture of anything that it's attached to um you could sew it but it doesn't need to be sewn because the panels themselves when you paste them onto the wall are can be cumbersome to work with when they're large so i did an entire wall in poly tab i don't remember the actual dimensions of it but the full piece was maybe 30 five foot by five foot panels so and and you know you just kind of paste them up you align them um and as you're putting them onto the wall they then make up a huge wall and and oftentimes you can't tell like people can't tell that it's even you know that's the material that's attached to the wall it looks like it's just been painted on yes uh there's an artist named uh, meg i call it mega mural um i forgot her last name it starts with an s but she did a mural like that in uh, uh, Chattanooga uh, on Martin Luther King um, Boulevard. Um, I, I called the MLK, I think it's called the MLK mural, but you can look that mural up. She painted the bodies um, and then had people, and then some parts she painted inside the studio where she had kids from a uh, university um, help her paint um, the faces and some, some parts of the mural and then they pasted it on there where she kind of painted everything else around. But that she all she they call her mega mural because all she does is mega mural. Murals are large. She's from uh, I think Philadelphia. That's awesome. How long does the design process normally take you? It's uh, uh so I usually a uh, week to two weeks. Depending on, uh, it might be a sketch that first week where I'm working on um, just a pencil sketch or however I'm doing it. I might talk to the person I'm painting for, or I need to show the design to, and I'll, you know, kind of go over some of the things I'm thinking about. Then that next week, I'm working on the actual digital mock-up, um, just so we can go ahead and complete it. Just so when you're designing, you're not having to go ahead and do a digital mock-up, do all of that work, and then they're saying, okay, let's change this, let's change that. And it's like, oh man, I just did this complete design or a complete painting. I would just show the sketch first. It doesn't have to be two weeks, but you know, one to two weeks, depending on the complexity of the design. So I would love to add to that, that I think I don't have a straightforward answer. I think like all art, some things come really easy and other things take a really long time and that's perfectly okay. Um, Grace, I think, 
however long it takes you is the right amount of time. <laughs> um, and you shouldn't pressure yourself to feel like it needs to be a faster process or a slower process. I think, um, I think there are things that you learn about yourself and your art, the more that you practice and do it. And I think um, just as far, you know, to add to what Woke was saying, it's like, depending on the project again, it's like, if it's a job, you might want to limit the amount of time you're taking on a design. Um, and that can also help help you set limits for yourself. Um, and that can help kind of train you into the practice of maybe this, maybe I should spend a little less time thinking about this part of it or obsessing over this part of the design or whatever it is. Um, but again, I think, you know, some jobs are more jobs and others are more, um, this is a signature art piece, um, and that's perfectly fine too. I love that answer. Don't put put so much pressure on yourself. Um, Grace, regarding the Cleveland um, mural that you're you've been hired to do, you will need to check with the Cleveland district that you are in to see what their zoning and signage uh, per, permit uh, restrictions are. Um, I can't, there's a, a permit guide that the, that is at uh, clevelandohio.gov that you can, uh, look for to see what, um, but the building owner, the property owner should be able to guide you as well. Um, and Eric, you want to know if there were, uh, uh, muralists who are taking people under their wings in Columbus. Um, we don't have a formal mentoring program, but what I would suggest is kind of watching Instagram and finding who is doing a lot of the mural work. Um, something about Columbus that I think is really brilliant is that it is a very supportive community, arts community. Um, Adam Hernandez, who's been, who's actually the person who brought all these folks together, um, is a great example of that. Um, but we have plenty, uh, Hakeem Callwood, Mandy Caskey, um, Brian Moss, it, the list goes on and on. I would just encourage you to find the names, see what whose work you like and reach out to them um, to you know, see how you can shadow or connect. There's a couple organizations. Um, the Franklinton Arts District is one, and All People Arts has a mural league. Um, it's good to stay stay connected with them as well. All right, Hunter, I'm not going to get to your last question. Are you okay with that? All right. <laughs> um, thanks, Eric. Well, let me let me get to. It. We got three minutes left. Would chalk or some other medium be best for the doodle grid line art? Anyone? I think Daisy should answer that since she's done some. Um, I would not use chalk. Uh, chalk actually, it does this. It's it would it creates like a barrier that paint doesn't want to stick to. Um. And again, if it rains, it washes away and then you kind of have to start over. Um, are you saying like for line art, like your your work is line art? Or are you asking that, um, I guess I, I wanna just understand, because there's oftentimes like, there's a difference when you're doing a piece that has a lot of negative space and you don't wanna mark the full wall. Um, and that's kind of a different, that's a different approach. But I would say like, I've used paint markers. I've used spray paint. Um, spray paint I love to use because it's really fast um, for doodle grids. It's fun. It's also like a great way to practice can control and using different, you know, it's, it, I think, again, I think that's probably my go-to for doodle grid. Um, let's see, doodle grid and line art before blocking in the shapes or fill. Yeah, okay. Um, then I would say definitely paint, whatever, again, whatever you're comfortable with, if it's brush paint, brush paint, um, you know, if it's a small piece, you could use paint markers. And then again, if it's a larger piece, I think spray paint is great. It's fast and easy and, and fun. Good. 
Um, one last thing Sarah noted, Wild Goose Creative has an art artist incubator that you can connect with uh, mentors. That happens around June. Thank you for that, Sarah. That's um, some really good information too. If you're not following GCAC's um, op art e-newsletter, I will be following up today with a couple of things. This recording, um, I will follow up with a way to sign up for that newsletter. In that newsletter, we do um, calls for artists. We lit not just ours, but whoever's doing a call for artists. We have free workshops like this one, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to make sure that you guys are tied into that so that when Wild Goose Creative is, is launching their mentorship program again, you'll be clued in on that as well. I want to say thank you to Brooks, Daisy, and Woke3. You guys rock. Yes. Um, thank you, all of you who showed up today. Um, I am randomly choosing a name and it's going to be um, Michelle Gladney. If I have your email, I'm going to be sending you a gift card for Yellow Apple, which is a black owned um, plant company in town, which is super cool. Um, and Michelle, if I don't, hi, Michelle. Um, if I don't have your email, um, you can uh, send me one at a Barrett with one T, a b a r r e t at gcac.org, and I will get that gift gift uh, card to you. Thank you uh, for being here. We do the drawings because we like for people to be here. To I mean, think of all the rich questions that you guys have done. It's pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see all of your work out in our communities. Um, and also, Brooks, good luck with the festivals. Daisy and Woke 3, come to Columbus. And yes. we will come to Milwaukee and Nashville and Reno to come see your mm -hmm. work. Yes, yes. Thank y'all. Thank you, thank you all. Good. Yeah, thank you so much. And again, if anyone has like real specific questions beyond, feel free to reach out. Um, we're happy to try to answer any other questions you might have. You yes, guys are yes, awesome. I will make sure they get all of your emails. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Bye. All right. Bye. Peace.